tell them something's going to happen in here tonight. <laughs> glory, glory, glory. Somebody acts like you came to have church tonight. Somebody acts like you came to throw down for Jesus tonight. My, 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 my. Whenever we get together like this, something is supposed to happen. There's too many believers in here for nothing to happen. Jesus said, where two or three of us gather in his name, there am I in the midst of them. And with all of these believers in here tonight, we ought to be able to lay, raise Lazarus up from the dead, shrink cancers, rebuke the devil, bind depression, and walk in the power of God. If you believe it, give God praise for it right now. Woo. I'm delighted to be here with you. It's an honor to be back with Pastor Daughtery and his lovely wife and your church and just to have an opportunity to see believers gather together in the name of the Lord. I think that we're setting a new precedence uh, in our generation in that we're coming into, it used to be that in order to fill up an auditorium like this, you, you had to have Michael Jackson Now you got to have is Jesus. And people come from everywhere and take off work and some get off work, swallow a hamburger in the car and do their hair at the red light and pull their shoes out of the trunk of the car and do their makeup in the bathroom and enter into his gates with thanksgiving and the courts with praise. If you're sitting beside somebody who smells like McDonald's, it's because they just made up in their mind, I'm going to get to church. I don't care what it takes. I'm coming in there. I'm coming in there. I'm going to grab a sandwich and run in the house of God and bless God and give him the praise because he's worthy to be praised. People don't understand what makes us gather like this. They think that we just gather to be gathering, but they don't understand that, that the Word is our confidant, the Word of God is our counselor, the Word is our friend, it's our therapist. We, could, we couldn't afford to go to the analyst, so we went to church. Wasn't no need in laying out on a couch and talking about our childhood. We laid out on the altar and said, Lord, if you don't do it for me, it cannot be done. <laughs> Hallelujah! He's been our marriage counselor. He's, he's taught us how to raise our children. He's taught us how to handle our finances. And I don't know about you, but I believe that when you obey the book, you can overcome any situation in your life. If you believe that, thank the Lord with me tonight. So I'm delighted to be here tonight, and I, I can tell it reminds me of the old uh, hobos in West Virginia. They, the, the train would already be in motion. And if the hobo was going to catch the train, he had to be able to run. When a move of God is already in motion, you can't come in and act sleepy. Because the thing is already rolling when you get there. You got to just go to running. How many are ready to run and catch a hope to the promise? <laughs> Look at somebody and tell them I came to run tonight. <laughs> nobody's going to have to drag me and nobody's going to have to catch me and nobody's going to have to pull me. I came. <laughs> Woo. My God, my God, my God, my God, my God, my God. I feel the tremors of an earthquake. I feel the tremors of an earthquake. I feel the tremors of an earthquake. Oh. Glory, glory, 
glory, glory, glory, glory, glory, glory. If I was the devil, I would just run out of here tonight. I would just leap out the window. I wouldn't even try to stay in the building. If I was a disease, I would just get out of here right now because somebody's going to pray to the power of the Lord. I'm excited. Y'all sit down, y'all and make me shout and run down the aisle doing the Watusi and do the Holy Ghost bump and the sanctified mashed potatoes because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out hallelujah. My innermost being cries out hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. If you don't do anything else for me, if I, if I never get the house I want or the car I want or the friends I want or the popularity I want, I thank you because you reached down in the gutter and you caught my falling soul and you saved me and delivered me. I'm blessed. No matter what I go through, I'm blessed because I have Jesus in my life. I, that's, that's sermon number one. You got about three more of them, and I'll go back to my room. But I, I'm honored. I'm honored to be here with you. Somebody teased me when I came in the door. They said I looked like I'd lost some weight. I told them I'm half the man I used to be. <laughs> Somebody said to me, he said, uh, how, how, how did you do it? I said, I suffered. <laughs> I suffered like the got on a treadmill, like the ran myself to death. <laughs> but uh, I purposed in my heart, my father got to the age that uh, I'm at now and got sick. He was a big man also, and he built a business, and about the time he got it up to some size, he got sick blood pressure went up so high it scarred his kidneys his kidneys failed his body got so weak that his heart eventually stopped beating he was sick for eight years and went from 280 pounds to 130 pounds and was dialyzed twice a week on kidney machines and all of that stuff and my father died when he was 48 and I was 16 and uh, the devil came along and said to me once I had been working and preaching and ministering and laboring for the Lord about the time I got around 39 he said I'm coming to get you and my blood pressure went up to 180 over 120 and uh, he said I'm coming to get you just like I got your daddy and I tell people all over the country at some point or another in your life you have to be prepared to fight your daddy's devil In fact, if you are wise, see, the devil doesn't have anything new. So he keeps regurgitating the same stuff, generation to generation to generation. But what he didn't know is that I was packing some stuff that my daddy didn't know nothing about. So I got my Bible in one hand and my tennis shoes in the other. And I start feeding my spirit and watching what I fed my body. And I got on the treadmill and said, I've been running for Jesus a long time. And I ain't got time yet. You not know, let me tell you, let me, if you make up in your mind that you want to live, no devil in hell can snatch away from you what God has for you to do. I told him, I can't die right now. I, I got to go to word explosion. I got some things to do. And God, God just did some tremendous things. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm excited about it. I lost 90 pounds, and uh, I think I think what's what's more important than than that was I found out how to take the Word of God and apply it against the thing that's trying to destroy you. And I found out that if you just take the principles, in fact, I'm getting ready to put together a book and share. There are certain things in this word that if you would aim it at the thing that's aiming at you, you can reverse the curse and get the victory. Come on, give God a praise. You can reverse. I don't care what it is. I don't care what it is. I don't care what it is. I, I, I don't care what it is. 
that devil might be intimidating you right now and saying you're going to get sick your mother got sick your sister got sick your mother had breast cancer you're going to have breast cancer like she did your father died at us you're going to die at a certain age that devil is a liar you got to take that word of god and say greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world just because your parents got a divorce doesn't mean you're going to get one. Just because grandma had a nervous breakdown doesn't mean you're going to have it. Just because your aunt had Alzheimer's doesn't mean that you have to have it. You need to plead the blood of Jesus and say, wait a minute, devil, I plead the blood against you. Well, that's not what I'm preaching tonight, but I could. all fired up. I've been putting together some notes for a ministry that I'm going to do in a book form called Lay Aside the Weight. And because uh, when you don't have time for it, look at somebody and say, I don't have time for it. Mm. You can't let anything or anybody hinder you. Somewhere out in the lobby or for you or somewhere around here, there's some books and tapes and some stuff that wouldn't be important if I just said it, but is crucially important because it's things that God said through me. Blessed to live in a generation that the Word of God is preserved in such wonderful technological ways. Many, many preachers who preached in previous generations gave great truth and we've got some gleanings of what they said but we can't hear how they said it or how they moved when they said it, or how they looked when they said it, or all of what they said. But we are privileged to live in a generation that our technology has enabled us to capture. Not only the word that's said, but, and I can't explain it, because I don't know, I'm about as technological as a one-foot rabbit, but uh, it's amazing to me how the anointing of God can get on a tape. I'm not even sure the technical people can explain it. But when the anointing really gets loose in a service, you can put that video or audio on and, 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 and it, you'll forget you're in your living room. And, and the preacher will say, touch your neighbor and you'll forget you'll touch your lamp and say. <laughs> I don't know how that happens, but, but it does happen. We, we get praise reports, people being healed and delivered, marriages being restored, uh, curses being broken just through tapes and videos. It's a wonderful time to be alive in the body of Christ. Go to the Gospel of St. Matthew as we prepare our hearts for the Word of God. I'm thankful to the Lord, my, my niece. I was going to say she's my oldest niece because she is, but that sounds like she's older than she is, is here today. Kelly, would you stand? I appreciate her being here in the service of the Lord with me. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I think I'm going to have a good time here. <laughs> I want you to get the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter number 16, <laughs> verse 17 through 25, and stand to your feet. Oh, how I love Jesus, sing and wonderful love me did you know he loves you no matter what you've been through sing oh how oh uh-huh yeah how I, I love Jesus I'm singing it oh Yes, I do. Really love Jesus. Anybody really love him? Well, it's all how I love him. How I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. 
that'll go all through you. Wasn't nothing special about you. He just loved you anyway. Look beyond all of your mistakes and just loved you anyway. Somebody else would have threw you away, but Jesus, he just loved you anyway. Somebody give him glory. Don't be 
stingy, give glory tonight. Don't save and don't hold it, give him glory tonight. Bless the name of Jesus, because he first, my God, he loved me. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> my God, he just, he just loved me. That still blows my, I know it's just a little old Sunday school song, but it still blows my mind right now. <laughs> he just loves me. <laughs> I don't have to impress him. I don't have to prove anything to him. He just loves me. Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. The book of Ephesians said, I'm accepted in the beloved. I don't, I don't have to try to get in the clique or get in the club. He just loves me. When you know that he loves you, it's not so important how other people feel about you. You're not so desperate and you're not so lonely because you know that he loves me. Look at somebody and say, he loves me. I better move. You might be tired of standing. Look at the 16th chapter and the 17th verse. God is so good to me. I can't help but praise him. I know some folk don't have to praise him, but I'm up under contract. I have a praising contract with God. Every so many blessings, I have to stop and say, thank you. If I don't praise them, the rocks of You don't want the cinder block in this building to have to start dancing for me, do you? I got to praise him. Look at somebody and say, I got to praise him. Chando. Mm. Mm. Oh. Let us look at the 17th through the 25th verse of the Gospel of St. Matthew. I like to read in concert from the Word of God. If you would join me in reading the Word, verse 17 through 25, the 16th chapter of the Gospel of St. Matthew. When you have it, say amen. amen. Let's read together. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Continue. Can you say amen? amen? Look at verse 24. Remain standing. We're going to pray. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. My subject tonight, an invitation to a cross. 
Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, we invite your presence. You don't have to break in. We invite you in. Manifest your glory in the midst of these, your people. We have not come to be convinced of thee. We are already fully persuaded who you are. We want to be equipped so that we might win others. We thank you for where you brought us from. It was such a terrible place. So glad to be gone from there. <laughs> And we thank you for where you're taking us to. It's so exciting that it gives us the courage to press through everything we're dealing with now. We believe you for miracles tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody shout amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. I have a tendency to vacillate in my study between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I like the Old Testament because the Old Testament details the lifestyles of the men and women that God used. And yet the New Testament points to the ministries and the words of the men. And so I kind of need both because I need to know what you said, but then I need to know a little bit about who said it. I need to know something about practical application to biblical principles. I need to know from time to time that God used men like me. So I need to be able to know a little bit about the specifics of their personal lives so that I don't begin to worship the men more than the God that used them. It is extremely important that we never fail to be naked before people and reveal the fact that we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency may be of God and not of us. Sadly, many of us are so busy trying to convince the people that we are excellent that we have failed to point them to the excellency that is of God. We must openly, adamantly confess and insist that we do have the treasure, but the treasure is in earthen vessels. They, that he put the glory in a clay pot so that people will not be confused between the contents and the container. And if they get anything from us, it, it must be out of the depths of the contents of the Holy Spirit in spite of the weakness of the container in which it has been placed. And we need to know that and we need to study that and we need to be aware of that, that even at our optimum peak of spirituality, we are filthy rags in the sight of God. What I like about the Old Testament, and particularly men like Job and Elijah and Elisha and David and some of the other patriarchs of the Old Testament, is that we get to ride the roller coaster of their lives. We get to see Elijah call fire down from heaven and then come down off the mountain and run from Jezebel. <laughs> That's good. It's good to see that you can be powerful one moment and scared to death the next. We get to see David run after Goliath with a slingshot and a rock and hit him in the head, knock him out, take his sword, cut his head off and be that powerful and be that victorious and then be on the roof looking at Bathsheba. Hmm. I know you can't nod right now, but later when you get home, nod tonight. Just before you go to bed tonight, just nod one time. You don't have to tell anybody what it's about, just, just one little nod. We, we need to see that even as Jesus, the, 
the, the manifested presence of God, the picture of God himself, God manifest in flesh, God tabernacled amongst us. Even when Jesus makes his debut and steps down through 40 and two generations and says, Lo, I come in the volume of the book to do thy will, O God. And he steps in the dressing room of a womb of a virgin called Mary and tabernacles himself in flesh and comes out God incarnate and becomes Emmanuel, God tabernacled with us. That even in the manifest presence of God that we still have Thomas doubting <laughs> disciples jockeying for position we still have politics in Jesus church you know with Jesus the pastor with with him the superintendent with him the bishop with him the prelate even in Jesus church we've got disputings and betrayals and and even though he handpicked only 12 one of them was a devil we need to know that so that we can just figure as leaders that one out of every 12. That's good for you. I mean, it just, it just helps your mind so that you don't get scared when you run into trouble and think you don't know what you're doing. You figure that if Jesus got one out of 12, I ought to be able to have, you know. We need to see that. We need to see that when people get saved that they do not ascend into the heavenlies like a jet running down a runway and just go up into the upper echelon and escape through the clouds and sit down in tabernacle with all the patriarchs of the we need to see that it's it's more like a roller coaster ride and that it's more like the old folks used to sing uh the old slaves used to sing sometimes up and sometimes down sometimes level to the ground but the storm is passing over hallelujah we need we need to know that life is tempestuous like wind and there are moments that you are spiritually astute and and and, and prepared to face the challenge and there are other times that you're trembling and saying god if you don't help me i won't be able to stand the storm we need to see that I also need to see that Jesus was not so busy pouring himself into the public. He was pouring himself into the disciples. Because I think sometimes we have taken on the mammoth job of trying to disciple people who are, who are not believers. I think that we have become ridiculous even in the world trying to get sinners to live saved lives. And criticizing sinners for sinning because sinners are supposed to sin. We, we had better focus on trying to clean up the church because it's hard enough to do that without us expecting people to live right without Jesus. I don't expect sinners to do anything. I don't expect them to understand me. I don't expect them to like me. I don't expect them to love me. I don't ex expect them to hold their marriages together. I don't expect them not to commit adultery. I don't expect them not to fornicate. I don't expect them not to be prejudiced. I don't expect them to do anything because without Jesus Christ, it is absolutely impossible. The truth of the matter is, even with Jesus, we struggle sometimes and have good days and bad days. So I know if you don't know Jesus, there's no way in the world you're going to love me. How you? Please. You need the Holy Ghost to be able to love me. You love me without the Holy Ghost, it just means you don't know me yet. <laughs> I can love him, you don't know me. <laughs> If you're going to walk with somebody every day and see all sides of their personality, the only way you can love a person seeing all sides of them is that the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. Jesus began to just take a little census to find out what the world was saying about him. He says, who do men say that I am? And they responded, the only answer that you can ever give to anybody who is a mover and a shaker in the kingdom. That is, some say. <laughs> some say, see, there will never be an agreement in the world about who you are. Some say, thou art Elias. And some say, thou art a Jer Jeremiah, and some say thou art a prophet. The, the only consolation you can have about worldly people is that God won't let your enemies agree. <laughs> the, the, the rumors will collide and argue as to who you are. Some say thou art a Jeremiah, some say thou art a Elias, some say thou art a prophet. He said, oh, no, no, I'm not going to waste time trying to change it. You don't see him trying to defend that. You don't see him arguing about that. You don't see him picketing and boycotting and trying to convince them as to who he was. He said, that's not even there. Who do you say that I am? 
You're the ones that I've poured into and labored with. You're the ones that I've given up my time and strength and walked across waters and seen people heal. And who do you say that I am? And out of 12 men, we always talk about the one who spoke, but I'd like to take a moment and point out the 11 who didn't. Because what is killing the church today is the silent majority who remain neutral in their convictions and can't quite make up their mind where they stand on any particular issue and they wait to take their cues from other people rather than to take a stand and say, as for me and my house, only one man out of 12 was bold enough to say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the true and living God. And he was the first man to answer Jesus' question in such a way that he just actually blew his mind. Jesus said, Wait, flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you. But my Father, which is in heaven, I wish I had time to really labor over that issue because that, 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 that was an awesome thing because what that means is Jesus had not taught them yet who he was. And for Peter to know who he was without being taught who he was, boggled even the mind of Christ. He said, flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you. This is, this is the first trace of Ramah before the cross. He says, flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. He says, some kind of way, Peter, you have tied into divine information before the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You are actually picking up, you are picking up wavelengths, radio waves from heaven, and they're coming to you, and you're starting to sense divine things, though you haven't even come to the point of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven has upon this rock I will build my church in other words I will build my church on the backs of men who can sense the truth of God in turbulent times I will not build my church on the backs of wimps weak panty wasted broke down intimidated scared to speak up men but I will build my church on the backs of men who will step out and say thou art the Christ And if you study church history, all throughout church ages, every time there was a major move of God, it happened on the backs of a man who got some sort of divine revelation that didn't even fit in with his generation. And most of the time, what we call truth today, they call heretics at the time it was being preached. They locked up nuns and threw them down in pits for speaking in tongues. There was a time in our lives that what we call precious today would have got you thrown out of churches. You know, there was a time you weren't always waving your hands and clapping and leaping and jumping but somebody's got to take the risk of being prosecuted in order to stand up for what they know is right. I'm sick to death of people who are preoccupied with being popular rather than being powerful. Sometimes you've got to take a stand. Instead of asking everybody, what do you think about it? What do you think about it? And I just don't want to be out of step with contemporary. What is everybody else's church doing? What is your church doing? What do you think allowed to be done? What do you think about what the pastor said? Do you think that's God? I don't know whether that's God or not. I've just got to wait a minute. Oh, please. Please. <laughs> I'm in a radical mood tonight, in case you can't tell. I have given up on fitting in. I'm not interested in running in the pack. I don't want to be in the clique and I don't want to be one of the good old boys. I come over here to serve him in the beauty of holiness. I come over here to walk in the power of his word. And I'm willing to be criticized to be Christ-like. I want the power of God to dwell in my heart by faith. Some of you, God could really use you if you'd quit trying to fit in. God could speak to you if you quit voting on everything he's trying to get you to do. You just got me tonight and in the morning. <laughs> Jesus answered and said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. He said, You're blessed. Simon, the word Simon implies that he was 
unstable. And I want you to underline something quickly in your Bible. I want you to underline three things. Let me get your crayon out. Yes, yes. We're in the Bible, Matthew 16, 17 to 25. Just three little things that might be of significance to you. I turned 40 last month and went blind. <laughs> I just woke up one morning and couldn't see. It's the strangest thing. Don't laugh, you're next. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't think it would happen to me. I didn't really believe that it happened to my mother and the other people. I thought they were faking. I want to testify to all the people that are still in your 20s. They're not lying. <laughs> you turn 40 and go blind. <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> I tried to fight it and rebuke it until I was in the book of Job and was calling it Ephesians. And then I said... I think I'm going to have to get some glasses if I'm going to survive. <laughs> Hallelujah. Everything don't get healed, got to get fixed. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm telling you, you got to make it work. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I said, if I don't get healed, at least let me see the word. <laughs> if I can't get it to work for me, I still want to see it. Yes, amen. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> I want you to underline Simon in verse 17. Peter in verse 18. And Satan in verse 23. Simon, Peter, Satan. Say that with me. Simon, <laughs> Peter, Satan. Hmm. Sounds like three people. Simon, Peter, Satan. Sounds like three distinct different people, doesn't it? Doesn't seem like that Peter would be Simon, or that Simon would be Peter, or that Simon would be Satan, or Satan, Peter. Seems like they ought to be three distinct people. But each name is in reference to the same guy. And in each case, Jesus called him by all three names. At one moment, he called him Simon, which means unstable, like water tossed to and fro. <laughs> Peter means rock. The next verse, he turns around and says, no, you're the rock. And then a few verses down, he calls him Satan. Simon, Peter, Satan. Simon, Peter, Satan. Isn't it amazing? In the life of one man and the space of five verses, he can go from being Simon to ascending to the high office of being Peter. Peter, thou art the rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Can you imagine what it would be like for Jesus to call you in front of all the other preachers? He'd say, you the rock. What you talking about, boy? Your chest would... <laughs> your day book would fill up for five years. I know you need me at your ministry. Jesus said, I'm the rock. <laughs> that would be awesome. And at one moment, he ascends above all the heads of the other disciples because he has a revelation. He goes from being called unstable and inconsistent to being solid and foundational truths to being called Satan. All in the space of one event. Upon the pressure, everything in you comes out. 
And in spite of all of our teachings about positive confessions and speaking the word and claiming the word and talking God talk and saying what Jesus says, you might say what Jesus says while we're listening. But if you get enough pressure on you, you're going to say some of everything, working yourself through the process to get to the place where you really trust God. If, if, if you read the book of Job, it sounds like Job is schizophrenic up under pressure. One moment he says, the Lord knows the way that I have taken when he has tried me. I shall come forth as pure gold. And the next verse, cursed be the day that I was born and the breast that gave me suck. Then he says, I know that my Redeemer liveth and he shall stand again at the latter day. Well, then he says, woe be unto me for I am cursed among me. That's what it's like to walk with God <laughs> up and down and back and forth. You might not say it, but you think it. There are times you don't know what in the world is going on. <laughs> Peter, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. You got revelation, man. You're hearing from God. You know who I am. Thou art the Christ. The son of the true and living God. And then Jesus says to him, don't tell anybody who I am. That's the most amazing thing. Because the one thing that I notice about anybody that's great today, they always want you to tell everybody who they are. <laughs> they send you bios so you get it right. Tell them who I am. I have accomplished this, 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 this. I matriculated from this university. I have these many degrees. I passed this many people. I have traveled around the globe. I am on television in so many different countries. I have gone around the nation. The one thing everybody wants you to do is tell everybody who you are. And Jesus said, Shh, don't tell anybody who I am. Because Jesus knew that when people know who you are too soon, they'll try to destroy you before you reach your purpose. So when God is going to do mighty things in your life, don't be upset when he hides you. Anything precious has got to be hidden. He'll lock you away somewhere, back up in a committee, in a usher boy, back in the back room, over in the corner, laid back people walking all passion, don't even know who you are, don't care who you are, not thinking about you. And you're saying, Lord, I don't understand why I'm being overlooked and over and ignored. I've got this burning in my hands. I've got this anointing in my hands. I've got this anointing. Of it. Why don't they call on me? Why don't they use me? It's because God is hiding you. When God is really going to use you, he hides you. Because if the devil knew where you were, he would destroy you. You ought to thank God that he hid you until you grew up, till you got strong, till the time was right. God hides what he loves. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of anointing of the Holy Ghost. Just three people tell him he hid me. That devil was trying to kill me, but he hid me. That devil would have destroyed me, but he hid me. I would have lost my mind, but he hid me. It wasn't time for me to speak, so he hid me. I had to grow up, so he hid me. I still had some crying to do, so he hid me. I still had some praying to do, so God hid me. Anointed, but hidden. Gifted, but hidden. Insight, but hidden. Powerful, but hidden. That's why Isaiah said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I better get on to the text. God is saying I'm saving the best for last. I hid you in the cleft of the rock. I hid you in the bulrushes like Moses. I'm hiding you, getting you ready, grooming you. Because if I don't hide you, people will do one of two things. Either they'll try to abort your mission, <laughs> terminate you before you ever get a chance, 
to do what God wants you to do. Or they'll rush your mission and try to crown you before you've been crossed. And you don't want to let anybody ever put a crown on you before you've had a cross. Because it is the cross that prepares you for the crown. And if you have not had a cross experience, the crown is too heavy for a head that hasn't rested on a cross. And so you only want what God wants you to have when God wants you to have it. And don't let anybody rush you into your destiny. Jesus said, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody who I am. Because real anointing doesn't have to be announced. When you are really the Christ, when you are really anointed, the name Christ means anointed, you don't have to announce it. When you're really gifted, you don't have to say so. Don't let anybody push your flesh buttons till you start parading your gifts. Because if you're really equipped of God, you don't have to say a word. The anointing will speak for itself. If God really called you to preach, you don't have to pass out business cards. If you really got a gift of healing, you ain't got to tell me, I'm a healer, I'm a deliverer, I'm an apostle, I'm all shut up, I'm a pastor. You ain't got to tell. If you really got it, the people who get healed going to tell it. The people who get delivered going to tell it. The people who get saved going to tell it. Don't tell nobody. I feel something in here. He said, don't tell anybody. You know, you have perceived the Christ in me. He says, but don't tell anybody. And then the next verse, he says, for I must suffer. Suffering is the lost ministry in the church today. We have taught everything, the gifts of the Spirit, the operation of the gifts. We have taught eschatology and biblical prophecy. We have taught the theophany and the anthropomorphic terms of the text. We have taught people how to communicate skillfully divine truths and to illuminate the most minute concepts of biblical concepts. But we have not taught them the primary pre requisite of greatness. We have not taught them to suffer. It is a spirit. Not only is it in the church, it's in the family. We've taught our children. We've got so well off now that we've taught our children everything except what made us great. We've given them everything, the best schools. We've given them the best education. We've given them the finest computers. We've given them the greatest technology. But if you think about it, that's not what made you great. What really made you great is suffering with little or nothing and pushing yourself along and dragging yourself up and not having enough money and not having lunch money and not having no new Nike tennis shoe, but purposing in your heart, I got to go anyway. Same jeans I had on last week, but I I got to go. You owe it to yourself to teach them to suffer. Because if my children know how to suffer, if something happens and I'm not there, hard times will never be able to kill them because they'll know how to take a licking and keep on ticking. So Jesus said, I must suffer. 
I got to go through some changes. He said, don't tell anybody who I am. I've got to go through some changes. I've got to suffer. I've got to be rejected. I've got to take rejection 101 to prove that this thing is not about popularity. I have to be thrown out of the circle, ejected out of the clique. I have to be looked over because the stone that the builders rejects becomes the chief cornerstone. You can never be great until you've been rejected. You've got to go through rejection. You've got to go through it. You've got to go through a time that you walk around people who don't have speak to you and don't like you and are not thinking about you and will not help you because God is training you how to be a soldier. You can't be a soldier if you don't get in a foxhole. You've got to have some lies told on you. You've got to be mistreated on your job. You've got to be lonely and still shout hallelujah. You are a soldier. Just three people tell him he's getting you ready. He's getting you ready. He's getting you ready. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He's getting you ready. He's getting you ready right now. He's getting you ready right now. He's getting you ready. That thing that hurt your feelings last week was God getting you ready. That thing that made you cry last month was God getting you ready. Those people who overlooked you, it was God getting you ready for your next miracle. God. You watch what I say. Anybody that is ever greatly used of God has endured pain and trauma and rejection and they've been ostracized and they've been lonely and they've been left and they've been forsaken and after they suffered a while I don't know how long a while is but after you've suffered a while he comes along and gives you your diploma and says now now I can use you now I can put you on stage not because of how wonderful your gift is but because you, your gift has been tempered in the furnace of affliction because I've taught you how to minister while your heart was broken. I've taught you how to be faithful in the midst of a trauma. I've taught you how to endure hardness as a good soldier so I don't have to sit back and worry about what the devil's gonna do to you because you've already learned how to endure. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. And so Jesus says, I've got to suffer many things. And then Peter, the big rock, the stone. So I rebuke that devil. See, sometimes we're trying to rebuke things that cannot be rebuked. <laughs> Peter is trying to rebuke suffering. Oh, no, no, we don't have to suffer. You believe the word. You just, you speak the word. You speak the word. What do you mean, Jesus? Haven't you read the latest book? You just don't, you don't have to go through anything. You just, I rebuke that. And that's when Jesus called the rock the devil. He said, get behind me, Satan. I said, but Jesus, he was the rock. He said, but now, now I call him Satan. One thing I want to talk about is I learned something about how Jesus evaluates people. We always have a plus and minus column. That's Sally. I like her. That's Mary. I don't like her. I know you can't nod, nod when you get home. <laughs> you wouldn't want anybody to think that you don't like everybody because you're with all these Christians. That's Richard. <laughs> And you can count on Richard, that's Michael. You can't count on nothing he says. 
That's Roger. He's full of truth. That's, 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 that's McGillicuddy. He, you can't trust him. To, we like to put people in columns. But Jesus didn't do that. He evaluates them not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit and what they manifested at that particular moment. And he had the ability to look at one person and see them when they were unstable and still celebrate them when they were solid and still discern when they were of the devil without changing his love for them. He always knew what spirit they were walking in from moment to moment. Can you, do y'all hear what I'm saying? Can you imagine how differently your relationships would be if you didn't have to file people? If you matured to the point that you could say, now that's Christ in you, but that's Satan talking now. Because if you can't do that, the enemy will use people who love you to shift you out of God's will for your life. He's too wise to use your enemies because you're not listening to them no way. He's going to use somebody you like because he thinks you're so busy liking them that you can't tell when he is speaking to Oh, you don't, you don't hear what I'm saying. <laughs> He said, get thee behind me, Satan. And let me tell you why he called him Satan. He said, for thou savorest not the things that be of God. In other words, you don't, because you have not learned to enjoy God's will for your life. But you have not developed an appetite for God's purpose because you just want easy boy religion. That's the devil. You know you're maturing when you can shout in a struggle, when you can, glo let me give you a Bible, when you can glory in tribulation. Mature Christians get happy at strange times. Weak Christians get happy because a check came in the mail, because a knot went down on the hand, because the boyfriend said, let's get married. Mature Christians have funny shouts. They shout over bad news. When the doctor says you're sick and it looks like I can't hear you, they get happy. Sir. start shouting like that, that means that you know that God's going to get some glory out of this. I don't know how he's going to work it out. I don't know when he's going to work it out. I don't know who he's going to use to bring me out. But somehow or other, God is going to make a way for me. Tell somebody, tell him God's going to make a way for me. He's going to make a way. He's going to make a way. He's going to make a way. I can tell. I can tell he's going to make a way. I can tell. I can tell because of what I'm going through. All hell is breaking loose, so God is going to make a way for me. The devil said I can't do it. So I don't know who I came to preach to tonight, but whoever it is, you're going through a little test. You're going through a little trouble. You're going through a little trauma. And it looks like you're going through a little setback. But the Lord said, get ready, 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 get
Y'all sit down before you make me run all over this place. I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I feel the power. I feel the power. I mean, absolutely feel the power. And so Jesus... Jesus.